Working Cows Podcast, Episode 85. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Howdy, everybody. It's Clay Conry, host of the Working Cows podcast, powered by the Global Ag Network. We are now uh, officially transitioned over there. So as I posted on Facebook this week, if I broke anything, if you're having to go somewhere you're not used to to find this, uh, please reach out to me, workingcows.net slash contact, or hit me up on the Facebook page and let me know. A couple of other things I want to get to before we get going with this episode with Cody Creelman is that at the globalagnetwork.com website, you now have the opportunity to set up a profile where you can be notified when all the podcasts are members of the network and there's new ones being added all the time. So I encourage you to check that out. You can set up a profile so that you get notified when those episodes go live of those podcasts that you have subscribed to through the network. So go over to globalagnetwork.com and check that out. Another thing is that this episode today was the result of a request. So I do take requests. I've got quite a big backlog of requests, but I do encourage people to engage. And here's a new way that we're going to do that right now is I want to encourage you to go all ahead and give me a call. Call me at 605-549- 5401-605-549-5401 and leave me a voicemail and tell me about how you heard about the Working Cows podcast, whatever you want to just call in and share. And I'm going to use that in future episodes. Uh, maybe I'll just start playing those voicemails at the end of the episodes, whatever it is, just call in, leave me a voicemail. Maybe it'll be voicemail roulette. Maybe it'll be everybody who leaves a voicemail gets played at the end of the show. Whatever it is, I want to start using some of that. So 605-549-5401 and leave me a voicemail and we will. I want to start engaging with you on that. Now, we're going to talk to Cody Creelman today and we're going to talk to Cody about castration. As I said, requested by a listener, but hey... There's even some paradigm challenging ways to think about castration. And Cody is a vet in Airdrie, Alberta, Canada, and he runs a bunch of different uh, vet clinics. He's part of a, a conglomerate of vet clinics and, and kind of over that as well. And so he's doing some interesting things there. He's also a vlogger. There'll be a link to his most recent vlog up at the show notes page as well. But for now, suffice it to say, Cody knows what it's talking about when it comes to bovine testicles, and I appreciate Cody joining me today. Cody, thanks for joining me today on the Working Cows podcast. Thank you very much for having me. So I invited you on because somebody asked me to uh, have a discussion about castration, and you are the uh, resident Working Cows vet, I guess, is, or at least the closest <laughs> thing I've got to it. So I reached out to you, and and you were willing, so here we are. So uh First of all, I guess we'll just start off with um, talking about why we even do castration uh, in a commercial herd setting. What is the what are the benefits of it? What are what are the reasons why people would do that? For sure. So you know, the first one is really just this cessation of of male hormones. So men are really difficult to deal with and uh, typically when we when we change their mind the the common vet term is you change their mind from ass to grass and uh and then you have some animals that are easier to handle so certainly from a from an animal handling standpoint it has been you know that's one of the reasons now you could make the argument that out until until weaning you're probably not going to have too many issues taking a you know, bold is six months of age, you're probably not going to notice any differences when it comes to to cattle handling if you're a commercial cow calf ranch, right? But that's that is one of the the old sort of reasons that we that we talk about it. Uh, another one is just kind of preventing the mating of of 
genetically inferior stock, right? Just as a generalized statement, uh, if we're if we're only selecting for the best of the best by by leaving a set of testicles in, then then certainly we're hopefully are propagating uh, superior genetics in our, in our livestock. Uh, avoiding price discounts in terms of the feedlots that that certainly is is an issue um, when you're looking at price discounts of bulls relative to steers the the number is quite variable but typically I'll quote in between you know that that 10 to 40 cents per pound in terms of a discount uh, that that exists out there in the market that said when you look at the the data set uh, it's only about what is it I think it's only about 60% of cow, commercial cow-calf producers in the U.S. Are, are castrating before weaning time. So it's pretty, it's pretty amazing how, you know, that there's still 40% of animals that are running through a, a cow-calf system in the U.S. that, that do not get castrated. That's a, that's a lot of animals coming through there. But, you know, that's, that's another reason that we do it on the cow-calf side is we just want to avoid those price discounts. They are real. They do exist. And, and then the other reasons that I really believe lie in from a feedlot perspective, not necessarily from a commercial cow-calf perspective. Right. So with, what time of year do you typically see people castrating? I mean, what, what are the majority? The, I mean, that 40% statistic is pretty interesting to me. So uh, I'll just throw out everything I think I know about castration and ask you a really obvious question. When do you usually see people castrating? So in my practice, my practice area, the typical time right now is birth. So the more common, I would say in that 75% range of people who castrate uh, prior to weaning, um, 75% would be doing it right at birth. Uh, they would be doing a, an elastrator band castration would be the most common with, within my area. And then the rest of them would be doing a, a surgical castration at branding time, which is typically six weeks of age. So where I'm at, that's the norm is uh, the surgical castration at branding time. I, I've been, I've not been around anybody who does it at birth that I know of. Um, so are there, is there any sacrifice of the uh, male hormones and growth when you castrate at birth or are you not gaining that benefit until much later, even after branding time or whatever? Yeah, you're actually not even really gaining that right out until until weaning time. So there's been quite a few studies that that have looked at, you know, comparing those castrates uh, to intact animals right on out. But I'll, I'll point one, you know, to one study uh, looking at, at animals that were castrated at birth um, and then those animals that were castrated at two months of age and their their average daily gain only differed by 0.1 pounds per day difference and it was it wasn't statistically significant so you don't have a difference in you know by in that weaning weight by doing it then and even the literature on doing it um you know doing it right out to weaning time it's not conclusive that you're really getting that great of a that great of a return on gain by leaving those nuts in even out to weaning time uh those those, those animals especially in later um, maturing breeds, uh, animals that aren't hitting puberty till later, they're really not getting the benefit out of, out of having, having those testicles. Very interesting. So in your context, are people generally calving through a barn and they're touching every animal in any ways? So they would be doing that or how is, how does that look? Yeah, I would say for the most part in in my geography, there is uh, some level of calf contact uh, prior to the branding time. Uh, so they would be putting in a, at, at least a management tag, uh, may, maybe an RFID tag up here in Canada, uh, and some producers would be giving a, a vitamin or selenium shot. And then also some producers who have had some issues with pre-branding time pneumonia may also be giving an, an intranasal vi modified live viral vaccine. Uh, those, those, you know, that would be pretty common that anybody calving from January, you know, the purebred producers right through into April typically would be running them through, a, you know, some sort of calving handling system, uh, getting dry off on those calves 
pairing them up and and then uh, sending them out to their to their nurse pasture. So they are getting touched. Yeah. And so what's the risk of missing a testicle with an elastrator uh, that at birth? Is it pretty easy to to find both nuts and make sure you've got them both? Or how, how does that look? If you can count to two, you should be able to do it without any sort of complications. So there, there has been also literature on looking at complication rates and mortality and morbidity. So some sickness in between castrating with bands at, at branding time. So that's still a thing that happens sometimes is guys will do a band castration at branding time. There's no statistical difference in, in anything in terms of morbidity, mortality, uh, complication rates, uh, missing, missing testicles when, it, when you're comparing the two. When we look at the data, there is no difference. Anecdotally, uh, certainly there is things that we can talk about uh, and why that so maybe that myth exists. Uh, when I talk to the feed yards, when, when they're dealing with a group of what we call belly nuts, so essentially a single retained testicle, uh, there's, there's a scrotal ablation, so there's no scrotum. Uh, one testicle is missing, but we do find a pretty high percentage of animals that do have a, a testicle that, that is a belly nut. So not an abdominal testicle, but just along the surface of the skin. The feedlot cowboys are convinced that, that, uh, this is an implant strategy that the cow calf guys are using where they're, where they're pushing one nut up purposefully, uh, not on accident and then castrating and, uh, getting the benefit of that, of that hormone, but not getting docked at weaning time. Now, nobody would ever do that, would they? I don't know. That sounds like some Alex Jones level. conspiracy <laughs> stuff. <in the> other. <laughs> You can't handle the truth. Yeah. This nut was an inside job. Uh, <laughs> yes, that was absolutely. a terrible pun. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> so they uh they truly they truly believe that when you look at the feedlot side. They they can't understand why they're cutting so many belly nuts uh on arrival uh or at, at processing a secondary processing. So they've convinced themselves of this uh of this old school implant technique. But if we're just talking about how hard is it to actually do the technique, it's exactly as I mentioned. If you can count to two, you'll make sure that everything's fine. Now, there is some considerations to that. Uh, you do want to make sure that your equipment is in, is in proper working condition. Like there, you don't want to be using those, those green elastrator bands. Uh, if they're cracked, you, they have an expiry date on the bag. We don't want to use them past expiration. So there's considerations that we have to make that, yeah, there can be issues if we're using improper equipment or expired bands. And if the uh, bands have been sitting on the dash of your pickup, the expiration date does not apply anymore. Is that accurate? Yeah, that would, that would, that goes also for, for darts as well, for treatment darts. If you leave it in the hot sun, your treatment, don't get mad when that Draxon blasts out back at you. <laughs> Yeah, that's not a cheap that's not a cheap mistake. <laughs> exactly right. Let's talk about retain nuts and complications within uh and how to handle those complications within any kind of a castration system whether it's elastrators or surgical removal. Uh what are the complications as far as the physiology of the animal and how should people handle those? Yeah. So in terms of complications, so the, when it comes to band castration at birth, uh, the, the typical complication would be that retained testicle or legitimately you have a cryptorchid. So a, a, an undescended uh, testicle. So that is an, a normal thing that happens in all species that uh, a certain percentage of animals legitimately only have uh, one testicle that, that is down into the scrotal body that you can actually get a band around. So in those cases, you certainly want to identify them, tag them as, as uh, intact, not, not banded, and you would just address that surgically uh, at branding time. So then you would have this animal tagged and identified that you'll have to go perhaps digging for, for that retained testicle. That's truly the, you know, one, the only complications when you're doing it at birth. Uh, I'm not saying that it's completely benign. Uh, when you're doing band castration at birth, there is inflammation around that ring site, but there is hardly ever any 
chance of, of infection or, or hemorrhage or any other complication when you're doing it that young. And from an animal welfare perspective, that is deemed the most animal welfare friendly um, way to, to castrate. When it comes to complications at branding time, uh, there, there certainly can be some. So when we're going with surgical castration, hemorrhage is always an issue. So that's typically due to technique uh, in, in how that sur- surgical castration is done. Experience is, is certainly another one. So, so hemorrhage is, is certainly an issue. Uh, once again, you can have a cryptorchid, you can have a retained testicle. That can be a complication that you have to decide, you know, is it worth digging or is it worth just leaving this nut in this calf and potentially getting docked? Uh, for having a staggy animal, which is usually my preference. I think in most cases you wouldn't get docked and it's probably better to to leave that nut in than it is to risk that animal's life. Uh, and then infection. So infection is a big one for sure. Um, m- most of the infection can be mitigated through a couple different things. One is just hygiene. So actually wearing gloves and using, um, you know, a clean scalpel and only touching the tissue that you're that you're going to remove and never touching the tissue that's going to stay behind in the animal. So for example, you, you cut that, uh, you cut that nut out and then you stick your finger up inside that, that incision site, you've just contaminated tissue that's going to stay with that animal. Whereas your hand can be as dirty as you want holding that testicle, uh, because you're going to cut that away and that's not going to lend itself to infection. So infection is an issue, but I think with proper technique and hygiene, it can be mitigated quite well. So are, are people in Canada generally doing the uh, elastrator bands because of the animal wear- welfare concern? Is there a regulation that's in place or uh, some kind of a discount that's placed on them at the sale barn because of a uh, knife cut or how, how does that yeah, so I would say that it's been that it's kind of twofold as to why the band castration at birth is is more popular up here. I think it's veterinary dri- or driven, so I think there is that's a, a common consulting thing that we talk about when people ask us what what is our preferred method of castration and when it comes to complications and when it comes to uh, animal welfare, we push them in that direction, uh, especially when it there is no benefit in terms of growth, uh, growth physiology in that animal. So veterinary driven. And then I, I do also think that it is um, just somewhat uh, been a cultural drift in terms of, in terms of having skilled labor there to do surgical castration, that can be an issue. So if you can mitigate one last step of having the calf castrator at a branding, that's, that's good. And then also just complications. So usually once they try it, they, uh, they recognize that they didn't have that calf hemorrhage. They don't have uh, infection, you know, castration site infections to deal with. So they, you know, that's usually why they, they end up migrating to doing it at birth. So when is it too late for a surgical removal? Um, is there a point? I know we, we talk about, you know, hemorrhaging issues and different things like that with a more mature animal. Uh, what, is there a timeline there that you would say it's too late for, for the surgical removal? No. So I, I actually always prefer, so after banding at birth, in terms of what I prefer is always surgical castration. So, you know, we have the, the opportunity to ban those animals at any time. But from an animal welfare consideration, I do prefer uh, surgical castration by a, skilled, um, by a skilled person using appropriate pain mitigation techniques. So given the option any day of the week, regardless of animal size, I would rather do a, do a surgical castration, but there's a caveat to that. I'm using an epidural, I'm using a lidocaine testicular block, and I'm also using uh, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory for pain control. The reason that I picked that is band castration past birth can cause um, s- some long-standing, I, would, I wouldn't call it necessarily low-grade pain, but long-standing pain and inflammation. When you put a calicrate band on a, on a you know, a 10 month old bull, which is common procedure in, in a feed yard. Uh, it, it can take 30 days or longer for that, for that, for that scrotum to fall off. And there is some significant 
pain that exists with that. We've done lots of trials, even within my own practice, uh, looking at animal intake, looking at uh, uh, pedometer data, so how much those animals move. And it's very clear at day 28 after band castration in a mature animal or a, a you know, a, a larger animal that at day 28, that's typically when that band starts to really cut through that skin and you can see that they're, they're in pain. So, so I always prefer surgical castration in Canada. We do have, we do have a uh, beef cattle codes of practice that exist that, that allow us to castrate an animal of any size with the caveat that we have to provide pain mitigation uh, for those animals um, w- when they're, when they're larger. So, so, the original beef cattle coda practice was nine months of age. So at nine months of age, we had, and we were doing castration, we had to provide pain control. Uh, now it's six months of age. So it was an animal that's getting castrated at six months of age must get pain control. I'm happy to report, though, that in Canada, uh, at least in my practice area, the vast majority of people who castrate outside of, of uh, birth with the bands are using non-steroidal anti-inflammatory pain control. So almost every calf that gets surgically castrated in my practice, if they're two weeks old or, or six weeks old or six months old are getting pain control. How is that administered? Uh, so the typical product that we use up here, um, is either injectable or oral. So we have two options. The active ingredient is meloxicam. So this is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory that actually lasts about three days. So it has pretty good um, plasma concentrations, like longer standing plasma concentrations. Uh, there's two, we have two product options. One is oral and uh, those, those calves essentially are down and they're getting processed. And you have uh, essentially a, a little, a little small drench gun. The animal gets three mils per hundred weight, so typically six mils uh, squirted in their mouth, and uh, that'll provide them with three days of pain control. Now, that does not control the pain at the time of the procedure, but it is still considered uh, to be pain mitigation uh, for the procedure because uh, those animals will have. Uh, uh, a level of of meloxicam in their system within the first twenty minutes of administration that will have an anti inflammatory effect. Sure. So, um, I just to give you a picture of the culture where I'm at. If I had to guess, and this is just my guess, I've been on a few operations, but not all of them, obviously. If I had to guess how this was going to be handled, uh, most people are going to knife cut at branding time. And if they came across an animal that needed uh, needed some attention after that or got missed or whatever, uh, and they were older, I can imagine that the the solution, w- if they were going to knife cut, would be to, to rope, head and heel, rope them, stretch them out, and knife cut them that way. The, uh, but that would not be typical. What would typically be done with an animal that got missed uh, that was older would be to run them through the chute and to ban them. <laughs> so right. it's kind of sounds flip-flopped from what your experience is well interestingly just it has nothing to do with castration but the one of the amazing things that has also just happened culturally here here is through the use of that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory in in the bull calves at branding time that are getting surgically castrated uh, producers up here actually started using it on all the animals so they're using it even on their heifer calves uh, just to control the pain of of being roped and and being processed, so they've noted a, a big difference in how quickly those animals pair up uh, with moms post branding and how easy it is to move those animals out because the pairing up happens so much quicker because those calves aren't sore. So there's no literature, there's no data to back this up. It's just been something that's happened culturally. Is is guys just feel that it's so much easier to work with the calves post branding processing event when they get a non steroidal anti-inflammatory. They think these calves are just kind of getting beat up, right? They get, they get ran in, they're crowded up, they get roped, they get thrown. Uh, so even and sometimes they get hot iron branded. Uh, so even if they're not getting the nuts cut out of them, they're still sore and people are really, yeah, really appreciating a noticeable benefit from how um, just how perky those calves seem 
after they're done the processing event, which has been fascinating. So now I have guys that don't even do surgical castration, uh, but they do rope those calves and they do um, vaccinate them. Sometimes they'll hot iron brand them. They're not even doing a surgical castration and they're still providing a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory to their entire branding group. Hmm. So can you talk about the cost associated with that? Yeah, absolutely. So the cost depends on the product that you want. And certainly it's always regional depending on, on the market, but it, it's typically around a dollar to $2. Dollar ahead for the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory or up to $2. Yeah, exactly. Depending on you know which product, how big your calves are. So I laid out the culture of my area as far as I understand it for you. Could you give me an argument, uh, basically against that or, or point out some of the, some of the disadvantages of that and some of the advantages of doing it, uh, the way that you were talking about with, uh, uh, banding at, uh, at calving time? For sure. So doing it surgically at, uh, at a young age, uh, I think, is an okay method. Um, certainly producers love the assurance of being able to see two nuts on the ground and making sure that it was, it was actually done. I, uh, I think it's, it is, um, not an animal welfare issue if we are doing it, you know, quickly with a very well, uh, well trained, uh, very skilled person doing the surgical technique. Uh, commenting, I, I would love to see you know, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory given to, to that situation. Uh, in the, in the older animals, uh, in terms of band castration, that is still very common up here as well to do a, a calicrate band of band castration of a more mature animal. Uh, it, de- it decreases complications when it comes to, you know, an unskilled laborer doing it. So what I mean is the reason that I think calicrate bands have become so popular for mature animals is just because they're, they're more foolproof. It's less, it's more difficult to, to, um, screw those up in comparison to doing a surgical castration of a, of a larger animal. So it's just easier to do with, with less skilled labor, uh, which is a situation that we see in a, in a feedlot setting, right? Um, it in some circumstances it can be cleaner so think of a really sloppy feedlot and you do a surgical castration that said when i'm doing surgical castrations i'm never giving antibiotics either even if they are going into a feedlot so i think when when it's a skilled person doing it you're mitigating a lot of the risks so overall i I think it's it, that is very typical, but if I could move the needle forward just in terms of the industry and animal welfare, uh, I would love to see band castration when we have the opportunity. So I'm, I'm not saying that all of you guys need to then get your hands on those calves at birth because that's just not part of your typical processing culture. Uh, if there's no need to touch those calves at birth, then there's no need to touch those calves at birth. And surgical castration at branding time is the next best option, I truly believe. Uh, but but if you are processing those calves already, then then I do think there is benefit to doing a band castration then. Uh, with a surgical castration at branding time, you're talking about uh, the anti-inflammatory being the the maybe the one thing that we could do to kick up their recovery or, or help them to deal with that pain, uh, of the surgery process. So, uh, I guess that's kind of maybe one way we're challenging a paradigm here today, uh, aside from the band castration at birth is that people could maybe look at adding, uh, a no, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, to their protocol at branding time and could help with recovery. Absolutely. But let's, let's talk about challenging paradigms altogether. So why do we even castrate, right? Yeah, let's, let's talk about that. (laughs) So that, that has always been something that has, has somewhat baffled me as well. So like I, I had given, cause your initial question was, why do we do it on the cow calf side? But we didn't really get into it. Why do we do it on the feedlot side? So Certainly, there is the decreased aggression um, to enhance on farm safety, right? So dealing with bulls can be more dangerous than dealing with, with steers. So that is an issue. I remember back in university when we were addressing this topic, um, one of the things was bulls just require uh, you know, more robust uh, handling systems, right? That was the question that came out. Now, I think the person that made that comment hasn't seen a, a modern feed yard and... Mm-hmm. 
I just about every modern feed yard I can think of would easily be able to handle from a facility standpoint, feeding out all bulls. Like there's, they're strong fences and silencer shoots. And so I, I don't really believe in that, that sort of argument. And then, and then it, the last argument is just really in terms of, of what the, the meat, like what the meat does, right? So the, the conventional wisdom is that through castration, we have an increase in quality of acceptable meat to consumers, right? So we have higher grade, more marbling and more consistent product when we castrate. That's the conventional wisdom. Now is, I don't know if that's, that's necessarily true. Certainly there is literature to support that to some extent. Uh, a lot of it's older meat science literature from the sixties. Uh, but then we just look towards the UK model, the EU model, and very rarely do they castrate. They're running, I've, you know, I, I'm active on social media and I have a large following in, in Europe and the UK and people love sharing their story with me. And I see these guys feeding out these, these beautiful bulls with no issue. They're getting them fat. They're super easy to handle. They're just like, yeah, I don't, it makes you wonder, right? Yeah, no doubt. That's good. Appreciate that. A uh, couple of other things that I wanted to circle back and recover or to and cover is: Would you say that a retained testicle is a heritable trait that would lead you to consider calling the female that produced that progeny? It certainly is. Uh, there is a heritable component to it. Uh, is that enough of a reason for me to want to justify calling that mama cow? It would really depend on what type of operation I have. So am I just commercial? Uh, then no, I would, I would leave that mom around. That doesn't really matter to me. Uh, if I'm purebred and I do have an issue, then, then potentially I would consider calling both sides. Uh, but that said, we don't see it that commonly. It would only be if you had a suspicion that you did have a bigger problem going on. What do you think about people who are trying to raise their own bulls? Is there value there? Can people are you seeing people who are doing it and uh, experiencing benefit or is it, do you think that the genetic benefit of somebody else's program is uh, enough that people should be buying bulls from outside of their herd? I think that uh, building up your own genetics and keeping back bulls is an amazing option. I think that it does take some work and it takes some planning and you, you have to have your goals well-defined and you certainly have to put attention to detail into it. But I, I know of, of lots of success stories and, and very good outcomes from doing that. So I don't, I don't think that's, that's absolutely necessary. Your genetics are a reflection of your environment and, and it, it's always tricky at times to put somebody else's genetics into your different environment and expect them to perform the same. Right. So I, I think it can be done with, with great success. Uh, that said, I also think that they're depending on the goal of your operation that you can purchase those genetics in and have great success as well. And, um, you know, in terms of, of this purebred versus hybrid sort of or composite um, d debate that that's existed in the industry. I think once again, it really depends on your operation and your goals. I think at times uh, purebreds can can certainly provide value. And I think at times um, hybrid or composite uh, genetics can certainly provide value depending on on what you're trying to do with your with your overall operation. And you're referring to uh, hybrid vigor and heterosis. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Um, so just one thing from a HR perspective, <laughs> I'll tell a story real quick. Um, we were branding one time. It was the first year my dad ever asked me to run the hot irons. And so it was, you know, probably 10 years ago now or so uh, around there. And I made a rookie mistake of standing on the wrong side of the calf to brand him. Right before I started branding him, I'd picked up the knife that was left on the animal uh, to uh, just get it out of the way. So I was branding this calf and he kicked the, my feet out from under me while I was holding that knife that was being used for knife cutting. And I ended up uh, cutting the person holding the calf. And I don't, I don't know how close I was to this gentleman's femoral artery, but it was way too close for comfort. <laughs> yeah. He, he ended up having to go for stitches and I didn't know it at the time until he got back from the hospital. Right. Uh, he had ended up having to go for stitches. So, uh, it was a, a very cheap 
lesson learned at that point. It cost me a bottle of Pendleton, um, but you know, <laughs> uh, uh, could have been a lot worse. And so that's just one thing to throw out there as a consideration. Now, obviously, I made a rookie mistake, but uh, having sharp sharp knives fl- floating around with hot irons is not that hard to extrapolate a set of circumstances where something could go wrong. So uh, just one consideration there. Absolutely. And then add on uh, vaccination needles, potentially implant needles, uh, ropes. Uh, yep. Yeah. And some of that stuff you're vaccinating with at branding time is not to be messed around with. You know, I've seen just small <laughs> yeah. pokes result in emergency room stays and, and hospital visits. And so not even an injection, just a poke with the residue at the end of the needle. So yeah. Yeah. Well, Cody, I appreciate your time today. Could you tell us a little bit about how we could keep up with you online and, and, uh, some of that stuff? For sure. I, I don't want to run this too long, but, but we did miss something that I did want to talk about when it comes to castration and that's, that's vaccination. So the castration vaccination um, it, it, as, as, as a potential solution to a lot of the issues that we're talking about. So I've been following this technology for quite a while and, and I'll try to be brief, but essentially Zoetis has a product in a few different countries, Australia and Romania. There might be a few more that had, it has license to with a product called Bopriva. So what this is, is a GnRH vaccine. So vaccination against the hormone GnRH, which is essentially the start of the cat hormone cascade. So GnRH then, then upregulates a variety of other sex hormones, which then causes you to go into puberty and that's what you know then you have uh, your testosterone and and you are a functioning intact male so you can actually vax there is technology that exists to vaccinate animals against gnrh and um and have them effectively be castrated now with the product that they have right now uh, it does require revaccination, so it would be two doses. And depending on the literature you look at, you would get from t- a, a initial vaccination and a redose, you would get uh, a- about six months worth of vaccination, so of, of castration, which in most cases uh, could potentially work. So I think in the feed, feed yard setting, um, you could do maybe not on arrival. So let's leave the nuts in for a little while. If we truly believe this, you know, in terms of carcass consistency and, and an increased quality product. So let's say we do want to keep castrating animals. You could do a delayed vaccination at about 30 days on arrival. Uh, when we typically do an IBR vaccination in the feed yards, do a revaccination again, 30 days later, and effectively have those animals castrated throughout the course of the feeding period. Uh, that seems like a wonderful option to me. Uh, and that could potentially eliminate castration on the cow calf side. If feedlots had the access to this technology, then, then why would we ever castrate on the cow calf side? The, the feedlots would just castrate via vaccine on arrival or, or however that works out from a processing standpoint. And, and there we go. Problem solved. So a couple of issues with it. A, there's a, cost associated with it but all of our all of the things that we're talking about have a cost associated with it calicrate bands are ridiculously expensive you know for what they actually are right and um there is a cost associated with surgical castration you have to you have to factor in your time and increase morbidity and increase mortality that exists with that it's not high but it exists so so we all have you know all of the techniques have costs associated with them um there is a consideration when it comes to human health concerns. So this is not a discriminating vaccine. So a, a vaccination, we were just talking about needle pokes, uh, vaccination could result in a temporary castration. So I say temporary because they've actually developed the vaccine for it to have to have this boost for the full effect to take course. They can make the vaccine uh, strong enough to be a single poke and you would be you would be effectively castrated for about three years. Uh, the, there's technology that exists for that. Uh, but from a human health concern, they actually split it up into these two doses. So you would actually have to be dumb enough to vaccinate yourself <laughs> twice with the castration vaccine in order to effectively castrate yourself. But that terrifies. When I talk to feedlots about that, that there's a castration vaccine, they're terrified about, you know, turning that loose and processing a thousand animals a day and have this, you know, have this thing in a gun. 
but I think the risk is relatively low and, and I'd rather be, I'd rather get two cc's of castration vaccine than two cc's of mycotil any day. <laughs> so really, or two, two cc's of a lot of things. I'd rather take the castration vaccine over two cc's of Draxin given, you know, accidentally. So I do think it's a good option, but I, I think even going forward, there's some interesting things that's happening. So I'm not sure in the U S, but this product under the Zo- like under the Zoetis brand actually ha- is already in Canada and nobody talks about it. Its label is called Improvest and they're using it in, in pig facilities. So they're, they're castrating pigs with this with, from my understanding, great success. Uh, the reason that it's a great success is you don't have to castrate these baby pigs. So from an animal welfare consideration, it's great. But from the packing side, the packers are absolutely loving it because the carcasses are even better than traditionally castrated animals. So they're perf- they're preferring it. Now there's tight regulations around it that you have to keep um you have to keep a log of every dose that goes out. Uh, you have to take a, a safety course before you're allowed to use Improvest in the pig barns. But then I'm going to blow your mind even further. <laughs> so they they were loving this this product so much when it came to the the male pig side that they started using it on the female pigs as well because you just shut down all their reproductive uh, functions and their carcass qualities improve. So they started using it on, on females as well. And if you look through the literature, there's some compelling evidence in cows, in, in female cows that, that also using this vaccine does have a, a benefit in the feed yard. There's some very compelling literature out of Australia that shows that, so they, so the Australians used a similar product. The product that the Australians used was one that was created by the, actually created by the, um, oh, what's it called? It, it's a, it's in the U.S. and it's a national um, agency that would be responsible for controlling uh, hor- feral horse populations. Hmm. I can't. I can't remember the agency name, but it, but essentially, a U.S. federal agency also developed a um, a version of this vaccine that then the Australians were using in feed yards, and they showed that they could have these positive carcass benefits in heifers. So I truly believe that if this came to market, that there could be nothing but upside for everyone. Uh, improved animal welfare, decreased complications, and improved carcass quality that then equals more dollars within the system. So I, I'm i very excited for that, but I have no idea when that would actually come to market large scale. Sure. Let me just make sure I'm understanding correctly. Is this, uh, this is a temporary uh, castration even with the booster? Is that Correct. Even with the even with the booster, there is still um, the body will c- come back and respond. But it, for the most part, depending on the data you look at, you would get a, a castration for for six to nine months. So essentially, you could prolong it throughout the feeding period. Right. Got gotcha. and you and you could give a third boost if it an animal was longer fed. Right, and so the function is of of basically castration and spaying of animals is that those reproductive hormones, uh, basically the body isn't wasting energy on those reproductive hormones. And so they're able to convert feed better. Is that a good understanding of how that works? That would be basic, but yes, that is one of the things, you know, certainly that's why we feed MGA to heifers, right? We're just shutting down those heat cycles. So it's not necessarily the hormone itself, but also some of the behaviors, right? Having a perpetual groups of heifers coming and cycling Mm -hmm. when you're trying to feed them out does doesn't do anything for conversion so yeah you know that it it's it's a little bit more complicated than that but but yeah that's effectively they're changing their mind from ass to grass once again to cycle back (laughs) sure no i really appreciate it great i'm glad we didn't leave that on the table um when i introduce this episode i will definitely make sure people know that they've got to stick around to the end to hear the real paradigm challenge (laughs) uh, yeah so appreciate you uh circling back on that so anything else that we've left on the table no i think that is it okay great so how could people keep up with you what are you up to uh keeping yourself busy online yeah, so still cranking out videos uh, in terms of my daily life as a beef cattle veterinarian in uh, Airdrie, Alberta, Canada. So anywhere on Facebook or YouTube, just type in my name and you'll find my videos on there. And if anybody has any questions, you can certainly uh, email me and that's uh, Cody at CodyCrowman.com. 
And if I didn't already put it in our previous episode, uh, I will put it in this episode, the uh, You Ain't No Calvet video. Uh, that was a good one. So <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> that was, so yeah, anyways, be sure to keep up with Cody online and, and there'll be links to all of that at the show notes page for today, workingcows.net slash 85. So Cody, thanks for your time today. Thank you very much. Well, I really appreciate Cody uh, taking time to join me and some good stuff there. Appreciate him not letting me go without that final paradigm challenge. Uh, Cody actually has a podcast of his own. I was a guest there on his podcast, uh, basically rehashing the stuff from episode 72, uh, free market capitalism, but some discussion and back and forth with Cody and I, that probably adds a little bit different flavor to that. If you're interested in it, I'll have a link to that at the show notes page as well, workingcows.net slash 85. Also go ahead and reach out, leave me a voicemail, 605-549-5401. Look forward to talking to you and hearing from you real soon. And I look forward to next week's episode where we're going to talk about a different way of thinking about bull testing with Glenn Jensen, who is also a vet in uh, Utah. As I said last week, all vets all the time here for a couple weeks here on the Working Cows podcast. Got some really exciting emails out right now, trying to work out scheduling with a couple of really exciting guests in the future. So uh, continuing to try and put out uh, really exciting content for you and uh, just excited about what's going on with the Working Cows podcast. We'll see you next week with another episode of the Working Cows podcast. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.